Welcome everyone to Sunflowers in the Park. Um, this story had its origins in my growing friendship with Toby Ebbs, my co-presenter. I would take him to places I knew and he would take me to places he knew. One of these was the park, the private housing estate lying at the base of the outcrop on which is perched the Duke of Newcastle's palace, which replaced New Nottingham Castle. As he showed me around, I started to notice how many houses were decorated with sunflowers in plaster and terracotta, and sometimes in wood. But more of that than on in the film. We had no idea at the time that it was the national flower of Ukraine. Since then, it has, of course, acquired a new and powerful symbolism, that of defiance against oppression. So we dedicate this showing of our film to the people of that country. But just before we start the film, can I ask that if you have any questions, and I'm very happy to uh, answer them as best I can, please put them in the chat box and uh, please make sure that you are muted until that uh, part of the event comes up. So thank you very much and on to the film. So we're standing in the absolute heart of the, the park estates where we've come today um, and we are right in the middle of this very elegant radial plan by T.C. Hine, the Duke of Newcastle's architect um, and we're here to look at the more unusual side what would you say of the, some of the buildings in the, in the yep. park estates. Yep. Um, I remember when I when we first came here and we were standing on the, this was several years ago, we were standing on the balcony of a friend's house and you looked up and you said, look at that, sunflower finial, aesthetic movement. And I thought, what, what are you talking about? I genuinely had, I'd heard of the aesthetic movement, but I didn't know anything about it. So that's what we're here to explore today, the aesthetic movement. Let's go and find some sunflowers. All right. So if the sunflower motif is the defining emblem of the aesthetic movement, what is this sunflower all about? Yes, well, it's not just decoration. It's a badge of allegiance to the aesthetic movement. And the aesthetic movement focuses on art, design, and the home beautiful. And it came out of... Um, Bohemia, actually, in France in the 19th century, when all the normal ways of life and political life and, and philosophical life went into the melting pot, and out of it came this strain called Bohemia. Because of all the social unrest from the French Revolution. Exactly. And so you've got a new strain out of that, which is concerned with exotics sensuality sounds all right, sounds all right. <laughs> now the british strand is rather less exotic <laughs> but nevertheless it is focusing on art design and the home beautiful the, the french poet theophile gautier coined the phrase la pour la which is art for art's sake so that was an approach that meant there should be no objective of no, no political, moral, or social objective. It is purely art for art's sake. Okay, so these are real purists. And if we look at this property, um, Glendower, built for William Foster, we don't really see him belonging to this purist aesthetic movement. He was, um, we've read his obituary, retired businessman, um, his father was mayor of Nottingham, so a member of the great and the good, not yeah. really yeah. as you would associate with it as an, with an artist. Unlikely, isn't it? Yeah. 
but perhaps his wife had aspirations to the aesthetic move. I mean, she would have to have serious aspirations because this sunflower is plastered all over the front and the back of the building. It's pretty in your face, isn't it? Yeah. We've come from Glendower and the, the sunflowers, but something remarkably different in, in style and appearance. And this comes from the, the story of the, the development of the park estate. So there's a ground plan of 1827, an unrealized ground plan by Duke of Newcastle's agent, architect. And it's incredible to look at it and to imagine that the whole of the park estate could have looked like this, this, this Regency stucco character. You have these rigid terraced street formations, the crescent curve that you might see in, in Bath. Um, or Regent's Park in London. John Nash at Regent's Park in London. And all of this comes from the Duke of Newcastle, who was trapped in the French, in France during the French Revolution um, as a young man. This is the fourth Duke. Absolutely terrified of the working classes and the proletariat. Um, and when he came to hold the estate, he, was, he had a very unhappy relationship with the corporation. He was Whig, he was High Tory. Um, they burnt the castle down, the, the mob burnt the castle down when he protested against the, the, the reform bill. So that 1827 plan showed he was trying to dispose of this land as quickly as he possibly could. And had that been realised, everything would have looked like this. Mm. And he was clearly building for the wealthy here, wasn't he? Mansion houses. Mansion houses. Yeah, and you see it along the ridge, along Park Terrace and the rope walk, lots of stuccoed houses, townhouses. As we all know, in our, when we go to our next building, everything changes in the mid 19th yeah. century and the stucco is absolutely wiped away for yeah. the, the red brick and the, yeah. the, the Gothic architecture that we very well know. So we leave behind this early 19th century Regency world of everything stucco, everything white, rendered, stuccoed. And we arrive in the mid 19th century with something quite dramatically different. You've got writers like John Ruskin, um, Thomas Carlyle, who've had this profound influence over society and it's manifested itself in architectural terms in, in this style. So what are, we, what are we looking at here? Here is an example of a bit of everything. Um, Ruskin, as you say, was one of the great influences and he, popularized particularly Venetian Gothic. And here you've got a bit of Venetian Gothic, this pillar holding up, or apparently holding up this oriel window, um, projecting oriel. Uh, but it, it's, it's all crazy, isn't it? Um, crazy, so crazy, the, 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 the word that it was termed this style is eclectic, so. Yeah. A, a blend of, bit of everything, a bit of everything, yeah. and doesn't yeah. really quite and, work. And, and Ruskin, towards the end of his life, very much regretted popularizing Phoenician Gothic because he saw it being miscreated all over the place. Which we see a good Which example see here. A good example here. So, he, what's, what's he, going on there? Ruskin would have cringed at this example of Phoenician Gothic because it's next to a curious doorway which has um, Romanesque kind of pattern dog tooth pattern, zigzag pattern, yeah. but in a gothic arch. Yeah, Romanesque, Romanesque inside of a gothic inside arch. Gothic. Yeah. Just let's get it all on there. Absolutely. And then you go up a bit further, there it's surmounted by a Jacobean gable with these extraordinary uh, finial pediments on the pediment. And horizontally, you've got Queen Anne detail. And the coved eaves. The coved eaves, which um, people like Norman Shaw used a lot in Bedford Park. So it is a wild mixture of, it yeah. is, it's a kaleidoscope of architectural details from different styles, yeah. different periods, inexpertly put together. Yeah, and architectural critics, uh, historians, the way it's looked upon this eclectic style is an era of slightly low taste, this mid 19th century period. Definitely, think. yeah. low period. Yeah. <laughs> and and made possible by these pattern books the builders had available to them. So yeah. we're talking about mass production of materials now, aren't we, into the mid-19th century, and the builders just selecting what they want, 
bringing it to sight and up you go. I think I'll be able to put this together. We've come from the eclectic mid 19th century era and we're getting towards the late 19th century now. Again, style has moved on, it's evolved, it's changed. The pattern of industry has changed, so we've no longer got these great lace merchants and barons. We're now dealing with bankers. This house was built for a banker, and we've got a very different style once more. Um, this is high arts and crafts. Yeah, this is arts and crafts, and a much more coherent essay. Um, very delightful essay, I think. Watson Fothergill had certain elements that he tended to repeat. You've got a large roof punctuated by a decorative dormer. The dormer itself has large overhanging eaves, as does the main roof, with projecting rafter feet, which are delicately shaped, picked out in white, punctuated by the turret, which has this delightful elongated finial sitting on a lead cap, uh, going up as a crown, and then the wind. I don't know. We we'll get a sound on the later, um, and finishing with a ball finial. A very individual design, not copied from anything. This is Watson Fothergill being creative and inventive. It, idiosyncratic. The, the chimney stacks. What's going on there? That's a truly quirky detail. Yeah, lovely decorative chimney stacks, but. The most eccentric part of that chimney pipes is these horizontal <laughs> pipes coming out of the cap. Now I've no idea if that's decorative, purely decorative. Can you imagine the smoke coming up. And... Somehow well, practical. I mean, <laughs> weird. I've never seen the detail. But, like but that. weird, idiosyncratic, peculiar details, the hallmark of Watson Fothergill. So it's almost like you can't pigeonhole him into the arts and crafts, the ordinary arts and crafts language of architecture, he almost has his own style. Well, he was very reassured, but very reassured of his ability to design by this time. He's got his signature blue brick banding and lovely little details. Look at the, the lead pattern work. of the lead caves in those uh, grid windows in the door. So intricate and delicate. Very delicate, very pretty. And also, if we walk down here, we can have a look at the entrance um, tunnel. Tunnel. I don't know what you'd call it, entr entrance way, uh, with its own gable onto the street. Yeah. Which actually is a feature of quite a large number of houses on the on the park. You see it? them in lots of different yes uh, entrances. And the this idea that the eclectic style, which we've just looked at, and the the asymmetry is uh, incoherent. We've got asymmetry here, but this is coherent asymmetry. Uh, this is an assured essay uh, and, and a much more coherent style of, of, of um, putting these elements together in a very pleasing way. Let's go and look at the entrance. Wait. Yes, let's. So do you see um, the lovely details, the ironwork? scrolly ironwork for the hinges. Um, the grill, now, do you see this is called the priest's house? Yeah. I mean, that is a suggestion that uh, it's like a, 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 a closed conventual building so that you slot open the entrance so you can talk through, but you can't actually see or touch it's through your humor. speaking. It's humour, they well, it's, I think this is, this is serious. I mean, oh, you think uh, this was serious? I, I think this is an allusion to some kind of um, um, religious retreat or something like but that. But do you not think with the amount of peculiar details on the building that Watson Fothergill or the, the owner was perhaps making a bit of fun with this? Well, he did have a print. sense of humour, I believe, yeah. But look at the uh, lovely way the timber framing is accentuated by the use of exposed and projecting uh, pegs. Yeah. And within it is the brick noggin. Yeah, the brick uh, noggin and then these lovely stop chamfer details. Yes, yes, lovely stop chamfer. The, the intricate lead work glazed in between the, 
the, the struts of the king post, the lead work uh, echo, echoing the brickwork. Okay, Barry, so more aesthetic artwork here. Um, incredible set of windows. We're looking at some truly beautiful stained glass. This isn't your everyday run-of-the-mill suburban Victorian uh, stained glass. This is the next level. One of the <clears throat> big influences on the aesthetic movement was Japanese art. And that resulted from trade reopening with Japan in 1856. Um, it, it had been a closed society for many years before that. And suddenly, Japanese art became available uh, to people in the West. And people, they were absolutely uh, transfixed by the beauty of their blue and white china, uh, their printmaking. Um, and their general artistic approach to design. And that was picked up by leaders of the aesthetic movement. And Owen Jones published a book called The Grammar of Ornament. And this is the kind of uh, leafy design, which was a very strong uh, type of design that was used in the aesthetic movement. Yeah, so you sent me a, um, a picture of a, a printed design and it's very close to this, isn't it? It's Christopher Dresser's design of leaves and branches and it's very similar to this. When we first saw these windows, we thought this is one-off um, commission. This is a one-off commission, but perhaps with it being so close to the pattern in um, the, 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 the grammar of ornament, are we looking at an off-the-shelf piece? I think it could be. and. We're going to have a look at the beautiful turquoise blue peacock tiles in the fireplace here. I'm pretty sure they were off the shelf. So it was a very influential movement yeah. and manufacturers then responded to the demand for this new pattern, um, this new uh, artistic approach to the house beautiful. And once again, the architect, Watson Fothergill. Fothergill. Okay, hey Barry, so we came here on a sunflower hunt today and this house has delivered. We've got sunflower terracotta, which surely is the, that's the holy grail, sunflower in terracotta. Um, we have sunflowers on the um, in tablature, in tablature on, the the on the central gable and perhaps most impressively of all, the sunflower finial on the on yes. the dormer. Yes, glorious. What, what's yes. this sunflower motif all about then? Well, as I <clears throat> said before, this isn't just decoration, this is uh, a badge of adherence and, and, and support for the aesthetic movement. So uh, this is declaring their, um, their, 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 their enthusiasm for la pour l'art, art for art's sake. Uh, one of the greatest champions of the aesthetic movement in the 1860s and 70s was Oscar Wilde. He was a massive self-publicist and attracted so much attention to the aesthetic movement. Um, he was cast, he, he was satirized in magazines like Punch um, and was shown carrying a sunflower, um, sometimes uh, with a lily in a jar in a vase beside him. Um, and in one cartoon, his face is the sunflower. So, I mean, he almost epitomized this sunflower badge. And he was, he was, he was satirized in a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, one of those comic operettas. This one's called Patience. And the central character, uh, Bunthorn, um, is given this wonderful uh, little ditty to sing. Though the Philistine may jostle, 
you will rank as an apostle in the high aesthetic band if you walk down Piccadilly with a poppy or a lily in your medieval hand. So to a certain extent, it, this is satire and the Victorians, the, the mid-Victorians aren't necessarily taking them completely seriously. Oh, I think the owners of this house would have been taking it very seriously. Absolutely. They would not like being satirised. No, no. And, and we do know from the present owner of the house that this was originally built or, or owned by uh, a photographer who was quite intrepid and, and went out to the Himalayas and, and took photographs there. So perhaps slightly more artistic than the industrialists we've been looking at elsewhere. I mean, it's much more likely that he was himself uh, a follower of the ascetic movement, isn't it? Yeah. So we come to the Park Estate today to talk about the ascetic movement. But we could not go past this house um, without stopping to, to celebrate the owner, the original owner, and the, the incredible stained glass, um, Maria Ogle Tarbottom. Um, this is your Mike Siebert, the, the, one of the owners of the house. Yep. And, um, and tell us more about Maria Ogle Tarbottom. Marriott. Um, this house was built for him in 1865. So it was one of the kind of second wave of houses in the park. And he'd already made his money by then, mostly. He was Nottingham's water engineer and uh, created the, the uh, current sewage system, then went on to design Trent Bridge and Papplewick Pumping Station, amongst other things. Looking at these two, individual pieces of stained glass, absolutely remarkable um, works of iconography, really. I mean, what's going on here? Well, I think on the right hand side, you've got the arcs. Um, that's represented by Nixville Cathedral architecture. Uh, you've got the lady painting. You've got a lyre, which presumably refers to music. And then the laurel wreath, I suspect, refers to poetry, because Dante is often shown wearing a laurel wreath. And then we move from the arts over to the sciences. I think so. I think that's the sciences. And the main clue to that is the uh, centrifugal governor, which <clears throat> is a reference to the wonderful Papplewick pumping station. By Mary Ogle Tarbottom. By him, who was a city engineer and created that uh, water pumping system. And then below these two figures, uh, we have this lattice work with these truly peculiar bits of artwork, individual pieces of artwork set within each, in each piece of glass. Wonderfully comic. Um, <laughs> a figure of a a tailor with his uh, crimping shears, as big as himself. Uh, and then you've got a dentist ripping a tooth out of some one patient. And on the right hand side, you've got a policeman apprehending a dog. <laughs> and down below, you've got a man finding his way to a pole on which there is a sign saying, North Pole, so an explorer, but there doesn't seem to be any sense of coherence between the pieces of artwork or any semblance of... Well, I can't see any coherence, but in the middle of both of these, um, uh, uh, this grid of, of cartoons... M.O.T. Is, ...is the, um, presumably, tar bottom, but possibly an E in uh, the middle, yes. uh, referring to his wife, Edna. Edna. come to the end of our investigation exploration around the park estate we've seen some incredible buildings we've gone through all of the different architectural styles of this period um, and it's interesting we've looked at the idea of the aesthetic movement belonging to either the architect or the, the, or the patron the patron the original mm. uh, resident yeah and we've seen two Watson Fothergill houses with the sunflowers. We've seen an Arthur Marshall house with, with, sun, with sunflowers. However, the Arthur Marshall house was a photographer, perhaps more of an artist, the other two industrialists. So where are we, where are we with this in, in considering 
who were the original patrons of yeah, this movement? I, I, I think the question remains open. We don't know whether it was um, Watson Fothergill as the leader of the aesthetic movement. He clearly was a paid up member. <laughs> Arthur Marshall seems to have been too. But perhaps the patrons were also. It seems curious to have such a strong branding without the patron, without the having owner, that having that input acquiescence. And, and, yeah, and acquiescence exactly. And the the idea that um, all of this was the Duke of Newcastle's estate, this high conservative arch Tory, and then becomes this beautiful suburb of of nottingham yes, almost yes. almost unique yes but during the, the 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 second phase in the 1870s and 1880s was contemporary with bedford park um, which was broadly it's generally considered to be the first garden suburb not to be confused with the garden city suburbs no, which was a 20th later. century ideology yeah, yeah. but the garden suburb being this genteel Victorian suburb for the wealthy and for the artistic right Bedford Park was very much for the artistic life the the house beautiful so there are close parallels so are we widening the interpretation of the park estate it means a little bit more than it has done so far I think it's interesting that it is contemporary with Bedford Park that's for another day absolutely Well, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, and I'm very happy to try and field any questions. Um, I'm looking in the chat box. Uh, nothing in there yet, no. I can't see any. So um, perhaps there are none. Uh, but if anyone would like to... Uh, Field me a question. I'll I'll be very happy to uh, respond. What well, one of the things we couldn't show because we weren't sure of um, whether we could get um, copyright for it was some lovely images, um, and I don't know if you can see this. Um, Lucy, tell me, um, is my camera good enough to show this? This is a lovely picture of Oscar Wilde um, holding a sunflower standing next to a lily. Yeah. And uh, here, here Oscar Wilde is actually as a sunflower. <laughs> And then, um, of course, the sunflower is the most remarkable design because um, it uh, it embodies or, or or has within it the geometry of the golden mean, uh, um, which I won't attempt to uh, explain here because I'm no mathematician. But uh, the uh, geometry of the sunflower seeds embodies this perfect proportion. And so I think that was perhaps uh, one of the reasons why it was chosen by the uh, followers of La Pour La. We've had a question from Anita, Barry, um, asking if there are any other examples of sunflower designs in other parts of Nottingham that you know of. Well, I don't know of any, no. Uh, I'm not saying there aren't any, but there does, curious, I mean, th this was the thing that struck us, that there is such a concentration of them in the park. And uh, there are more than we showed in this little film. Um, and it's quite good fun walking around the park, um, spotting sunflowers. <laughs> But do let me know if you find any sunflowers um, in the rest of, of Nottingham. I should be very pleased to understand that. Um, if, if anyone wants more of the 
um, story of the aesthetic adventure um, in Europe and in Britain. This is a, a, a extremely uh, well-written account of it by William Gaunt. This is my 1957 edition of it. Um, so I, I suspect it's not in print, but um, it's a terrific read. And uh, I got uh, really caught up in it when I was a teenager. Another terrific volume um, is this Biden edition of a book called The Aesthetic Adventure. I don't know if my camera shows it well enough. There we are. Yeah, yeah. Well, if there are no further questions, I will call this to a close. Um, the next um, attempt of um, architectural oddities will be a little film called Gentry Violence in Worksworth, which is about hijinks uh, in Worksworth in the 17th century, when uh, the gentry um, were known to be bashing each other up. Um, it, it stems from the Derbyshire Historic Buildings Trust owning a property built by William Hopkinson, uh, one of the uh, principal players in this story of violence. So um, that is yet to be filmed, but I hope um, you will log on and watch that when it becomes available on Architectural Oddities on YouTube. And thank you very much for watching today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Barry, there is just one more question that's just come through from okay. asking exactly where is the Park Estate, please? Well, if you if you if you locate Nottingham Castle, go down hill and you'll find it. It's at the foot of the uh, rocky outcrop on which Nottingham Castle perches. I think there'll be some people going to have a look after this talk. Thank you, Barry. That's great. OK, thank you very much and goodbye. I shall end the meeting now. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.